In this video, we are going to dive into the internal workings of write ahead logs and finally implement one for ourselves using Go. I delved deeply into the topic in my latest newsletter, which you can find linked below in the description. For a more comprehensive understanding, I recommend reading the post before continuing on with this video. Whiles are found in a variety of systems, ranging from databases such as Postgres, MySQL, SQLite, to consensus algorithms like Raft. At its most basic, a while is a file where entries are appended at the end. This append-only method is crucial to its functionality. As entries are always added to the end, write operations are remarkably quick due to the absence of disk seeks. Plus, this approach minimizes the risk of corrupting existing data, as previously written data remains unaltered when adding new entries. When a system such as a database initiates a write operation, it first records this operation in the val prior to updating any on-disk structures. This step is key to ensuring that the operation can be recovered, even if the system crashes before the write is fully completed. Essentially, a val is comprised of a series of log records. Each record typically contains information like the log sequence number, the stored data, and a cyclic redundancy checking code. Entries in the val are sequentially ordered, and each has a unique log sequence number. The CRC code which is generated using the LSN and the stored data plays a crucial role in verifying data integrity during WAL reads. The nature of the data stored in the WAL varies depending upon the system in use. In a database context, an entry might contain details about a transaction, including its type, the data involved, and the timestamp. In the event of a system crash, these logs enable the database to replay transactions and restore the system to its last known consistent state. During reads, the VAL recalculates the CRC for each record. If the recalculated CRC doesn't match the original, the system flags the data as corrupted and returns an error. Since VALs typically serve as auxiliary data structures to primary systems like databases, their performance should not impede the overall system. To optimize write operations, VALs often use an in-memory buffer for temporarily storing incoming writes. This approach enhances write speed at the cost of some durability. The flushing interval for a val can vary, often set to a few hundred milliseconds. But this is generally adjusted according to the specific requirements of the application. An important aspect to note is that simply flushing the buffer to the disk doesn't always guarantee data persistence. This is because operating systems use their own in-memory buffers for disk writes to optimize performance. In the event of a power outage, these in-memory buffers might be lost before the operating system has a chance to synchronize them with the disk. To address this, operating systems typically offer an F-Sync API. This API can be used to force synchronization of the buffer with the disk, ensuring data durability. A well-designed VAL takes advantage of this API, thereby reinforcing the guarantee of data persistence, even in the face of unexpected system failures. Since every state change in the system is expected to be persisted into the VAL, the log file can grow to be massive in size. A large log file slows down startup and recovery processes of the VAL. To efficiently manage this, VALs employ a technique known as segmentation. In this approach, the log file is divided into smaller, more manageable segments. Each segment is allowed to grow only up to a fixed size. Once it reaches this limit, the segment is closed, and a new one is created for subsequent entries. Segmentation offers several benefits. Firstly, it enhances the performance of the VAL, making it easier to manage. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it introduces a level of fault isolation. If there's corruption in one segment, it's less likely to impact the previous closed segments. This means that in the event of a fault, recovery processes can be more effective, as they would typically only need to address the affected segment without having to worry about the integrity of the entire log. Now, let's address the crucial aspect of valve repairs, or how valves handle data corruption. Despite the effective isolation provided by log segmentation, it's essential to recover as much usable data as possible from the corrupted segments. This repair process usually concentrates on the most recent log segment, as this is where the corruption is most likely to occur. A common approach to repairing a VAL involves sequentially reading through the entries in the latest segment and verifying their integrity. This includes checking aspects like the consistency of the data, the correctness of the end of file markers, and the validity of the checksums. This process continues until a corrupted entry is encountered, indicated either by a damaged data point, an unexpected end-of-file marker, or an invalid checksum. 
The log file is truncated at this point, removing the corrupted portion. This action results in a clean log file that retains only the valid entries, thereby ensuring the integrity of the data. With this understanding of val repairs, we are now ready to dive into the actual implementation of a val and explore how they function in real-world scenarios. Here we are inside VS Code. Instead of writing code line by line, I have already implemented the write ahead log and we will be examining the functionality and the code base. This approach not only saves us time, but also aids us in building the mental skill needed to comprehend an existing code base, which is similar to what you'll encounter in real world as well. So let's head over to val.go. This is the file that contains most of the code for a write ahead log. The first thing we do is we define the struct for the val. The struct has a couple of member fields, the first being the directory. The directory is the name of the directory inside which we want to store all the val segment files. We then have a field called current segment that holds the current log segment file that we are writing to. Then we have a lock. This lock is used for synchronization of the val writes. We then have a last sequence number that tracks the sequence number of the last entry into the write ahead log. We have a buffered writer to write to the log. We have a timer. The timer controls the flush interval for our buffered writer. We then have a should f sync option. This option controls whether we want to run an f sync every time we flush from the memory to the disk. We then have a max file size. This field controls the maximum log segment size that we want to allow. Once a log segment exceeds this size, we create a new segment. We then have the max segments parameter, which controls the maximum segment files that we want to maintain in the val. Once we exceed this number, we start discarding the oldest segment files. Then we have the current segment index. This is the index of the latest log segment. And finally, we have the context and cancel functions. These are used to control the go routines that we spin up in the val. So let's see how we initialize and open an existing val. We use the open val function for this. This function takes in a couple of arguments. The first being the name of the directory in which we want to store the val. The second being enable fsync, which controls whether we want to sync to the disk every time we flush. Then we have the max file size that controls the maximum log segment size. And finally, we have the maximum segments. This controls the maximum number of segments you want to maintain in the log. Next, we ensure that the directory in which we want to create the log exists. This does not do anything if the directory already exists. Next, we get all the files that exist inside this directory. This is only relevant when we already have an existing log and we are just opening it. In case of a new log, the files will be empty. In case we have some files returned, we want to get the file with the latest segment, since this will be the file that we'll start writing in. In case there's no files, we create one and this will act as the first segment file for our log. So whatever this file is, we open that file up and seek to the end of this file. We seek to the end to make sure that we're only appending to this file. Next, we create a context and a cancel function. We'll use these functions to control the go routine that we run later on and initialize the val. And before we return, we update the last sequence number of the val by reading the last entry in the val. So what this method does is it gets the last log entry and gets the last entry's sequence number. In case it doesn't find one, we simply return zero as that will be the sequence number that we start from. We'll skip the get last entry in log method for now, since it will only make more sense once we understand how the writes are happening. And it's pretty similar to the read all method that we'll go over. So let's go back to the open val function. So once you received the last sequence number in the last segment that we just opened, we set it to the val and finally return it. We also run a go routine before we do that. This go routine controls the intervals at which we sync our in memory buffer to the disk. So let's head over inside and see what it does. It uses a for select loop to listen to two channels. The first one being the timer, and the second one being the context.done channel. This channel is only used to exit the go routine once we are closing down the val. The timer channel is more interesting. We first lock the val and sync it to the disk. The val.sync method is pretty simple. It flushes the buffered writer, which is the in-memory buffer to the disk, and checks if it should fsync. If the fsync option is enabled, we run the sync method on the val file that we are writing to. The fsync is often a slow command. That's why we allow the users to control whether they want to run this or not. Running this means slower writes, but higher durability and vice versa. And once we sync, we reset the timer. The reason we are resetting the timer inside the sync method and not inside the keep syncing go routine is because we allow the users to call the sync method manually. And in case they do so, we want to reset the timer in that case as well. And that's all we are doing inside the open val function. Next, we're ready to see how we write entries to the log. We first lock the val for synchronization, and then we check if we need to rotate this log before we write the next entry. The rotate log if needed method is quite simple. It gets the file info for the current log segment file. It checks whether the current segment file exceeds the segment file limit. In case it does, we rotate the log. 
Otherwise, we return. The rotate log method simply syncs the val to the disk so that the current file's contents are written to the disk safely and it closes the current segment file. It increments the segment file index which starts from 0 and increments from there. Then it checks in case we have exceeded the maximum number of allowed segments. If we have, we delete the oldest segment file based on the segment index. Then we create the new segment file for the current segment that we'll start writing to. And we set this new file to the current segment and we update the buffered writer to start writing to this new segment file and we finally return. Going back, once we've rotated the log if needed, then we create the entry using the data that we just received. Let's see what the create entry method does. The first thing we do is we increment the last sequence number to get the sequence number for the current entry. Then we set the data on this while entry and finally we calculate and set the CRC code for this while entry. We calculate the CRC code using the data and the log sequence number. And one last thing you might be interested in is where this while entry struct comes from. You'll see that it comes from a generated file. This file is generated using our protocol buffers. We define the proto definition inside types, types.proto. It's a pretty simple protobuf file. We define a message for the val entry, the first field being the log sequence number, which is an unsigned 64-bit integer. Then we have a data field, which we store as raw bytes. And finally, we have the CRC code, which is a 32-bit unsigned integer. The reason we use protobufs is because their serialization is much faster as compared to something like JSON. And it also allows us to have strong type guarantees. Once you write out this protobuf file, you can generate the auto-generated files using this command here, which runs the proto-c compiler to generate these go files. Finally, after we've created this entry, we write this entry to the buffer. Remember, we first write this entry to an in-memory buffer to increase the write throughput. The write entry to buffer method is pretty simple. It first marshals this entry using the must marshal utility method that we define. This is similar to a helper method that I discovered in the etcd codebase. It calls the protobuf marshal method on the entry that we are about to append. And in case this method returns an error, we simply paddock. The reason for this is that this method should never return an error unless there's something really wrong with our protobuf definition or our code base in general. So in that case, it makes sense to panic. And finally, it returns the marshaled entry. The must unmarshal method also operates in a similar manner. So once we've marshaled this entry, we get the size of this entry because before we write out this entry, we want to append this size. Since marshaled protocol buffers do not have a delimiter, we use the size to know how long the protobuf entry is. So the first thing we do is, we write the size to the buffer, and then we write the marshaled entry. And finally, we return. And that's how the write entry method works. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Next, let's head over to the read all method. We'll go to the project outline and go to read all. The first thing we do is we open the file in read only mode. Next, we read all the entries from this file object. Let's see how the read all entries method is implemented. We first initialize an array to store all the entries that we'll be reading. Next, we start up a for loop. We first read the size of the entry, because remember, when we were writing these entries into the log, the first thing we stored was the size of the data that we were writing. So we'll read up this size and then initialize an array to store this data next. This array is the same size as the size that we just read. Next, we'll read data from the file until this array is filled. Once that is done, we'll have all the data we need for the first entry in this data array. Next, we'll use these raw bytes in this data array and unmarshal them and verify their CRC checksum. This is done using the unmarshal and verify entry method. Let's jump in and see how that works. We first call the must unmarshal method. This method unmarshals this data into the entry object so that the data is now available in the form of a val entry struct. Now we send this object to the verify CRC method, which verifies the checksum. We do this verification by calculating the checksum again in the same manner we did while writing this data down into the log. We combine the data and the log sequence number of this entry and calculate the CRC. Now, we compare the CRC with the one that is stored beside this entry. If these match, it means the entry is valid, otherwise we return an error. And finally, we return the entry. Once we have this entry, we append this into the entries array and continue on the for loop. Once we reach the end of the file, we break out of this for loop and return the entries. Now, if you notice, the read all method only reads the latest segment of the log. You can see that we are reading the file name from the current segment. But sometimes you might want to read from a certain offset. For that, we use the read all from offset method. This method takes in an offset, which is the segment index from which you want to start reading. 
For example, you can start reading from the first segment all the way to the end, and it loads up all the files in the while directory. It iterates through the segment files until it reaches the desired offset, and once it does, it starts reading each of those segment files and adding entries from those segments into the entries array. Once it completes, it returns these entries back to the caller. Now that we've learned how the read and write paths work, we're ready to see how the log can repair any broken segment files automatically. In the project outline, let's head over to the repair function. The first thing we do in this method is to load up all the files in the while directory. Then we see which file has the latest log segment and load it up into memory in read-only mode. Next, we seek to the beginning of this file because as we discussed, we start reading from the beginning of this file until we reach a corrupted entry. We initialize an array to store all the entries that we'll be reading and then we start our for loop. The flow is very similar to how the read method works, except we handle the exceptions a little differently. We first read the size and we attempt to read it from this file. In case we face an error and unless the error is an end of file error, which would mean that we did not face any errors and we successfully reached the end of the file without any corruptions, we replace this file with a fixed file. Essentially what we're doing here is in case we face any error that is not an end of file error, we take all the entries that we've read so far, write them into a new file and use that file to replace the current broken segment file. The replace with fixed file method replaces the broken file atomically. We'll see how this method works in a little bit. In case we were able to read the size successfully, we'll read the data. In case we face an error while reading the data, we do the same. We take the entries that were successfully read so far, write them into a new file and use that file to atomically replace the broken file. In case we were able to read the data successfully, we'll deserialize the data and make sure that the CRC is valid. In case the CRC is invalid, we do the same thing that we did before, which is replacing the broken file with a new one which only contains the fixed entries. And in case we did not face any error so far, we simply append this new entry that we just read into the entries array and repeat this process until we find a broken entry or the end of the file. And that's all this method does. Let's dive a little deeper into how the replace with fixed file method works. It takes an entries array which contains all the entries that were read successfully and creates a temporary file. It marshals all these entries and writes them into this temporary file in the same manner that we were handling all the writes. Once it has written all the entries successfully, it closes this temporary file and calls the os.rename method to rename the temp file with the current segment file's name. The operating system handles this operation atomically, so we know there is no chance of data corruption at this stage. And once we've done that, we return from this method. And this is how you implement auto repair in your val. And that does it for the core implementation of a write ahead log. To see how you can actually use this log, we can refer to one of the test cases that I've written. Let's go to the tests folder into the val test.go. The first test that I have displays an end to end flow of writing to and reading from a val. We first open up the val. We pass in the max file size and max segments. We allow only three segments here and we pass in a max file size of 64 MB. We then write a couple of entries into the log and then attempt to read them. Once we've read, we just verify that the entries are read successfully. In a similar manner, we test almost all the functionalities of the log. Let's go to the project outline. You can see we even test the repairing functionality. We open the log, write a couple of entries, purposefully corrupt the data and then run the repair. Once we've repaired it, we check that the correct entries were still recovered and that we're still able to write new entries into the log successfully. So feel free to browse the code and understand this project a little deeper. The link to the full code is down there in the description. Again, I'd highly recommend that you go through the blog post to get a deeper understanding of how write ahead logs work and their internal implementation details. And that does it for this video. So subscribe to my YouTube channel and my Substack newsletter for more technical content.